I've been thinking about velocity and what's motivated me in my life and in my creativity and what's propelled me in my work as a radio producer and writer has been this sense of not belonging to a community, a particular community. And throughout my life, I've felt like I've been on the outskirts of community. And so I want to talk about what it's like to be an outsider, and what it's like to create as a way to belong. It's heartening to hear stories like Lillian Pitt and Toma Villa, who have a very strong community and are very connected to it. For many people, that may not be quite true. Many people might belong to a lot of different communities, but not one single community. What's motivated me as an artist has been the hurt, pain, and anger of not quite belonging. So why do I feel like an outsider? Well, I'm going to start from the beginning to a time where I felt like I did belong. This is me in Japan at the Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, I was born in Taiwan, or made in Taiwan, as I used to say. <laughs> and um, my family um, moved to a military base just outside of Tokyo. And uh, my mom, actually my mom was Taiwanese, and my dad was an Air Force sergeant. And we lived in this neighborhood in Japan, just outside the base. And I recall those as some of the happiest times in my life. I, I, my brother and I lived there until I was about eight, and I just felt like I had a community that I fit in. This is me in my kindergarten class, and I still have, I'm in the front row to the, I guess the left there, and I still have the same cowlick issue with my hair. <laughs> and here I am. Here I am with uh, a lot of mixed race, white, and Asian kids, and I felt like uh, we didn't talk about race. We were all dressed up in our Sunday best and posing for the kindergarten photo. But here in Japan, we were all Americans. It didn't matter what race we were. We were all Americans. And then my uh, family left. My, uh, my dad quit the military, and uh, we moved to the States. And we moved to Reno, Nevada the first year. The second year, we moved to Boise, Idaho. And then the following year, we moved to Junk uh, Eugene, Oregon. And then the last year, we moved to Junction City, Oregon. It was a town of about 2,000, mostly Scandinavian townspeople and farmers who seemed to be descendants of pioneers. And everybody, everybody seemed to have a street named after them. <laughs> With each new move, my, uh, my younger brother got shyer and shyer. With each new school, each new town. And on the first day of school, my uh, mother came to meet us at the bus stop. We had moved to a, a small two-acre farm of scrub brush, and it was beside this busy, noisy highway. And she wanted to make sure that we were safe. And as soon as the kids saw my mom, I heard this chorus of, they're Chinese. From the front of the bus to the back, all heads turned to my brother and me as we made our way down the aisle to get off the bus. From that day on, my brother um, was, the, was really the brunt of bullying and pranks that would now be called hate crimes, all because he looked more Chinese. That's the day that my family changed. It, um, 
Every, everything changed that day. My, my mom and dad started to fight a lot, and my mom hated the isolation, hated that she had no one to speak the language, and hated that she couldn't drive or read, and we had no community. And my brother retreated into this inner world that he still lives in much of the time. And me? Well, I became secret Asian woman. Secret Asian woman learned to pass. She learned to go undercover. She learned not to talk about what made her an outsider. She also, being secret, found out what most people thought about Asians. I wish I had been brave enough and confident enough not to be a secret Asian. Instead, I, uh, I withdrew to my bedroom and I wrote scripts and plays based on my favorite TV shows like Star Trek and Kung Fu, and I also read Shakespeare out loud to myself. And then, mostly, I just blended in. Here I am in my journalism class, and I am to the left in the second row, Cowlick issue. So, so um, at school, in high school, luckily we had the arts. So I joined in drama and band and choir. It was really hard during assemblies. <laughs> so I was doing all these different things. And I felt like I finally had some kind of way of belonging. It gave me this sense of belonging. But I still, regarding race, I still remained secret. And it wasn't until after I graduated from college and I started doing theater and, and radio that I started telling people stories about my mom, about how she was sold to work as a bonded servant when she was two years old, about how she was beaten and abused by her step-parents, about how she ran away when she was 13 during World War II with bombs flying and planes strafing the land, and how she believed in a female Buddha, Kuan Yin, that she credits as saving her life and protecting her. It was in doing these stories that I started to explore what it meant to be biracial. So I decided to go to Taiwan with my mother and do this radio documentary called Mei Mei, A Daughter's Song. And Mei Mei is a term of endearment in Taiwanese for any little girl. But it was also the way I felt about my mother. <laughs> I'm serious. They say they sold. For how much? Plus Japanese and 20 yen. 20 yen? I don't know. They need the money. How did you feel? I don't have any fear. You don't? Mm -mm. I don't have a fear. I don't have any feelings. Because I don't care. I don't care. Nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. We spent a month in Taiwan and we started to fight a lot. All of our cross cultural, cross generational differences came to a head. And uh, even though Mei Mei broke new ground for me creatively, my mom hated it. She absolutely hated it. It was also the first time that she had heard her voice recorded. And it was also the first time that she really listened to me. After that, I decided to turned it into a stage play, and my mom came to see it at the theater, and of course, she hated it. <laughs> but you know what, she, was, she left the theater with tears in her eyes, so I think it made us closer for a time. So after that, I wanted to explore more about being Asian, so I wrote more plays, and this one is based on her religion, my mom's religion, Kuan Yin, Lady Buddha, I called this play. And I, after doing all this, I, you know, I started to feel kind of Asian, you know? And so I learned 
actually more what it was like to be Asian. I learned more about my mom's religion and about being the dutiful daughter when my mother had a terminal illness and I took care of her for three years. And after she passed away, you know, I had this weird thought. I wondered if I would still be Asian. I know, it sounds weird. So in thinking about this, I uh, came to realize there's no one Asian community. There are so many different ethnicities, so many different nationalities that don't really connect with each other. So I decided to bring everyone together somehow. And I did this eight hour Asian American history series for public radio. It had never been done before. I'm George Takei. This is Crossing East, the first Asian American history series on this radio station. And all that we got paid was two dollars. That was slavery. America was telling the immigrants that we don't care about you. Crossing East on this radio station. Crossing East was the hardest project I've ever done. There were so many roadblocks to funding, to deciding which stories to tell because there were so many to tell. And it was even hard to get stations to air it. And it was often heartbreaking, but I did it and I'm glad. I don't know if I'd do it again. But after all of that, after all these years, I finally felt like I could call myself Asian. And I'm also mixed race. And as a radio producer and a writer, I, I try to tell stories of people who are on the outskirts. I luckily survived being an outsider. Not everyone does. My brother, after, my brother, after years of living in this inner world, his greatest joy right now is his compulsion to collect bottles and cans from dumpsters. I was lucky. Being an artist saved me. And so after doing all of this and thinking about this and telling you my story, this is what I've learned. Being an outsider actually helped me. It helped me to be a bridge between others and hopefully, hopefully be a bridge between communities. Thank you.